everybody. New questions tonight about the death of millionaire pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Officials say he committed suicide in a federal prison in New York while awaiting prosecution on sex crimes charges. But cameras weren't working in the facility and guards were said to have been sleeping rather than making their rounds. Epstein's official cause of death was suicide by hanging, but today on Fox News, forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden said he believed otherwise. Dr. Bodden is, of course, the husband of criminal defense attorney and law and crime host Linda Kenny Bodden, who appears frequently on this broadcast. Earlier today on this network, the Boddens discussed the revelations in detail and showed a never before seen image of a suspiciously fractured bone from Epstein's autopsy. Was it more consistent with the homicide, Jeffrey Epstein's death? More consistent as from the information we now have uh, as a homicide. And indeed, one of the things you're showing us and has never been seen before is a diagram and a, a picture from the autopsy report, which we have actually here on the screen. The red arrows were added by me, by the way. Now, that was not the original. But it shows the fractures, the three fractures you discussed, one in the hyoid bone and uh, two in the thyroid cartilage, if I get that right. right. Uh, and there you can see them. Look at them on the, and that's actually uh, Jeffrey Epstein's hyoid bone on the uh, right side of your screen and the diagram of where the three fractures were on the left side of your screen. That analysis continued with questions from Law and Crime's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross. He died August 10th, found in his cell. The yes. autopsy was done the very next day. Yes. And you were there. Yes. And was there anything else unusual you saw about? Were there marks on the throat that would suggest a rope of some sort? Yes, there was a ra round, circular furrow, dried furrow, which indicated a lot of pressure with the ligature, uh, and also that had been there for a while because but when they took the ligature off, it, everything was dried up underneath. So immediately we could tell that he had been dead for many hours. So is that and, consistent, and though, with a suicide? That, that is unlikely in a suicide. In the suicide, the ligature is usually higher. And it's not consistent with manual strangulation, but it is consistent with a ligature being tied around. And one of the things uh, we have to investigate from time to time, uh, especially in prisons, is whether somebody was strangled manually and then hung up to make it uh, look like a suicide. One fracture is unusual. Tap two is rare, and we've never seen three fractures in a suicide. Brian, can I just ask hanging. one question? In 50, in 50 years. In 50 years, you've never seen three fractures in a, a suicide. It's, it would indicate that it's a homicide then. Well, that would, but we don't have all the information. Dr. Michael Bodden said the additional analysis is necessary to come to a definitive conclusion. For instance, here's some of that additional possible evidence. The guard who claimed Epstein was hanging refused to speak to police, according to Dr. Bodden. Plus, forensic evidence such as DNA wasn't gathered from the ligature. Also, there were questions about why video surveillance equipment wasn't working. Bodden says the person who did the autopsy didn't rule Epstein's death a suicide. That determination was made later to the frustration of Epstein's family. The official finding that it was a suicide came from your old office, the New York City Medical Examiner. Yes. You're up against them now. Well, I have a difference of opinion. It looks like that we don't have all the information. The problem is once a, a, a death is classified as a suicide, that's the end of the investigation. And the person who did the classification was the person who conducted the autopsy? No, the, Not the person who did the... The person who conducted the autopsy in my presence f uh, did not think there was enough information at that time to call it a suicide. Because did not. This is su did not. So she put down pending further study, meaning pending further investigations. All those investigations, uh, getting information from uh, the wardens, from the inmates, uh, getting DNA from the ligature uh, as to who was handling the ligature, stops as f if it turns out to be a suicide. And one of the things that Jeffrey, uh, that Mark, Jeffrey's brother, was trying to get is why did the uh, medical examiner's office change from pending investigation to homicide? They must have received some kind of additional information not present at the autopsy. And who made that determination? The, ch the chief medical examiner. So not the person who did the, actually conducted the autopsy? That's correct. He kicked it upstairs? Well, the chief medical examiner can make the decision and... Uh, but it wasn't present from what you saw in the autopsy. That, that's correct. The reason I was willing to speak this morning uh, to, to the media was that uh, Mark, the brother, asked me to because he was so frustrated 
that there didn't seem to be any active investigation into the cause of death. With us are two attorneys tonight. Gigi Gonzalez is in Miami. Byron Brown is in Phoenix. So, Byron, Dr. Baden is working with the family, but he was there to observe the autopsy, and his job is to sort of raise questions about this. I thought there were some effective questions raised here. If this determination that this was a suicide basically shuts down other evidence gathering, that just raises more questions in my mind. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I agree. There's a lot of questions that don't have answers, you know, why the cellmate left, why the guard wasn't on duty, what happened with the video surveillance, the guard not talking, all of these things definitely lead to a valid conspiracy theory or a theory that this was a homicide as opposed to a suicide. I just think at the end of the day, um, this man, I believe, committed suicide. The fact that it's not consistent with other suicides isn't enough in and of itself to make me believe that it was a homicide. Uh, I think there's just a folly of events that have led to this being a very spectacular event wherein people are going to believe probably forever that Epstein was murdered as opposed to committing suicide. Gigi Gonzalez, I mean, oftentimes we have this in cases. It's uh, something spectacular, as Byron said, and then there are a lot of what ifs that add up. And look, the easiest to believe story is that he probably committed suicide. We would feel a lot more comfortable knowing that if all of these other pieces of evidence lined up, though, right? Exactly. And it's really hard to lay your head down at night, you know, sure of what's happening here, right? Because as Dr. Baden said, you know, it could be a suicide. At the same time, you have injuries that are consistent with twice or three times the amount of pressure that you see in a regular suicide. And that definitely strikes up some interesting questions as to what exactly happened here. But there's no doubt that Jeffrey Epstein definitely had a motive to kill himself. He was facing some very heinous charges here. Oh, certainly. And, you know, there were all sorts of questions about exactly what other information he had. You know, did he want to protect other people? Did other people want him gone? The answer to that is probably yes on both accounts, Byron. Yeah, I, I think 100 percent. I think there's definitely people out there that didn't want this guy to see another day of sunlight. And he's also facing very heinous charges. So, again... There's, there's all the ingredients for the recipe of uh, version one, that he committed suicide, and also version two, that someone murdered him. Exactly. And I don't know the answer here, but this is certainly an interesting discussion. Let's move on tonight. A U.S. Navy SEAL sentence and rank reduction in a war crimes court-martial will stand, according to officials with the Navy. Former Chief Petty Officer Eddie Gallagher was accused of murdering and shooting civilians while he was deployed in Iraq. Gallagher was acquitted earlier this year of most charges against him, but he was convicted of one count of appearing in a photo with an ISIS fighter's body. The jury, composed of mostly Marine combat veterans, sentenced Gallagher to a reduction in rank and four months confinement. He was released with credit for time served. A contempt hearing for the prosecutor who oversaw part of the case against now convicted Dallas police officer Amber Geiger has been pushed back. You watched the case unfold here on Law & Crime as a jury convicted Geiger of murdering Botham Jean. Geiger entered his apartment, saw him, and fired. She said she was confused and thought she was entering her own apartment. The judge in the case is attempting to hold the DA in contempt for speaking to the press. He defended himself of that charge earlier on the Law & Crime Network. It was unfortunate that the defense chose to deal with that in the manner in which they did. Um, but no one has actually looked at the gag order. I did not violate the gag order. Number one, all I said was I thought the murder charge was appropriate, and that is well within public comment. I have a First Amendment right to say that, and it did not violate specific provisions of the gag order. The other thing I said was that I had no idea how the jury would see the case or what the verdict would be. And in addition to that, I had written um, a piece on this case uh, back during the election when there was first a controversy about whether it was murder or manslaughter. And I explained all of that, including her defensive issues. So it's a matter of public record. And so I didn't do anything to violate the gag order. Back during the trial, this is how the judge who oversaw the Geiger case addressed this issue.
And let me be clear. On last night, the evening prior to the start of this trial, our elected DA did an interview about this trial. On Fox 4 News, Your Honor, yes. And I have, I have a video and the article from Fox 4 and the screenshot from the uh, date of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked that Mr. Cruzo could not have made an appearance. But could you please admonish your boss that the gag order extends to him as well? He is not above the gag order. The district judge overseeing that judicial district has moved the case out of the hands of the judge who actually is seeking this punishment and is reassigning it. Two cases in the news this week raise questions about what law makes, what the law rather makes criminal and what the law does not make criminal. Both involve a charge not found in every state involuntary manslaughter. The first case is out of Richmond, Virginia. A defendant, Claire Carr, who is an attorney, hit and killed three people on the road last year. The three were involved in a previous accident where no one was hurt. Carr apparently didn't see it in time. Prosecutors said she was texting. They originally charged her with involuntary manslaughter, but she pleaded to one count of reckless driving. She'll serve one year in jail with work release. Prosecutors said Virginia law is, quote, inadequate when it comes to prosecuting distracted driving. Another involuntary manslaughter case is brewing in Massachusetts. Prosecutors there announced yesterday that the indictment of a Boston College student for allegedly sending abusive texts to her boyfriend before he committed suicide on his graduation day. Charging In Young Yu, 21 years old, of South Korea with involuntary manslaughter in the suicide of her boyfriend, Alexander Ertula, 22 years old, who leapt to his death. The investigation revealed that Miss Yu used manipulative attempts and threats of self harm to control him, yet she persisted, continuing to encourage him to take his own life. The indictment alleges. Miss Yu's behavior was wanton and reckless and resulted in overwhelming Mr. Ertula's will to live and that she created life-threatening conditions for him that she had a legal duty to alleviate, which we allege she failed to do. Many have noted this recent case in Massachusetts has a lot of similarities to the Michelle Carter case. That's where a Massachusetts teen was prosecuted and convicted for spurring her boyfriend's suicide. Carter's attorneys argued that the involuntary manslaughter statute should not apply to a situation where a defendant wasn't even present for a suicide. Here are some of the appeals court arguments. Michelle did not push him and coerce him into taking his own life. This court respectfully identifies as the one fact that shows that she had some hand in, in putting this fatal plan together that at one point she said, Google ways to make carbon monoxide. That can't be enough for a teenager to say to another teenager by text, Google a way to kill yourself, somehow makes her responsible for a plan that he's, he's concocted well, but and put you, in effect? If you combine Google how to kill yourself with then go back into the car, um, yeah, that's collabor corroboration, isn't it, of the other point? I mean, you've got multiple times where she says, just do it, right? right. Get it over with. Let's jump in with the panel now, Gigi and Byron. We're talking about these involuntary manslaughter laws. Apparently, Massachusetts prosecutors are a little emboldened by the Michelle Carter case, and they're going after this college student suicide as well. Prosecutors in Virginia are saying, wait a minute, we've got a similar statute, but we're not going to go after this driver who killed these three people in this car crash because the law isn't strong enough. Not a lot of states even have involuntary manslaughter. So, so Gigi, it, it's sort of like a catch-all in a lot of states saying, well, you know, if there's some kind of criminal recklessness or negligence that results in a death, we'll sort of scratch it out to be involuntary manslaughter. Other states wouldn't even see this charged as a homicide case, right? Exactly. And that's what's interesting about involuntary manslaughter. It's the unlawful killing by reckless conduct. And what's really the debate in there is what is reckless conduct? And in these cases, in the In Young Yu and in the Michelle Carter case, the, uh, the reckless conduct is words. They're using their words to encourage an illegal activity, which is suicide. So it's very, it's an interesting charge. It's an interesting um, law. 
And I'm interested to see how it develops here in these cases. Yeah, Byron, what do you make of this? I mean, in some states, we wouldn't even, as I said, see these prosecuted as homicides. In Virginia, I think the facts were a little bit weak to even jump that far up the chain because the defense said, well, you know, the crash could have been caused by the text message or it could have been caused by the fact that she only had eight seconds to respond without potentially looking at the text message. So the facts didn't really fit either. Yeah, the Virginia case, I think, is, is is a lot different. And I think that's probably why Virginia is saying, hey, look, we're not sure that this law is aggressive or prosecutable like the U case. And the U case is different than the Michelle Carter case. In the U case, there's 47,000 text messages from this gal to her boyfriend over a two-month period. She was present at the time that he killed himself. So I think it's very important that laws like this exist in every state, hold people accountable for this sort of behavior, uh, it's something that I think we're going to see more and more of, and at least I hope. I, I like the, the stance that Massachusetts is taking, and I like the fact that they're being aggressive on it. So we'll see what happens with the U case, but I think you're going to see her convicted as well. Exactly. It's an old law applied to new technology. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, updates on cases we are waiting to cover here this week, including the killing of a Colorado mother. And prosecutors suddenly dropping two of the nine charges they expected to bring in the retrial of an NFL player charged with sex crimes. We'll talk about those upcoming cases after the break. Now to some other criminal cases we're watching closely here on the Law and Crime Network. More than 1,700 potential jurors filing through a small Colorado courtroom in the case of a man accused of killing his fiancée around the holidays last year. Prosecutors say Patrick Frazee beat Kelsey Barreth to death with a baseball bat. Crystal Kenny is the state's key witness. She says she was having an affair with Frazee when he killed Barreth and called her to clean up the meth. Barrett disappeared after this surveillance footage released by authorities shows her out grocery shopping with her baby. Opening statements in her fiance's trial are now scheduled for Friday. We can't broadcast it or tweet from the courtroom under the judge's orders, but we will update you on the case as best we are able. Barrett's mother spoke early in the investigation to describe her daughter and to say she just would never disappear. I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about Kelsey. She's not the kind that runs off. This is completely out of character. Kelsey loves her God, she loves her family and friends, and she loves her job. She's reliable, considerate, and honest. We've created the Facebook page, Missing Mother, Kelsey Barrow, as a site that gets her face out there, that's used to spread the word that she's missing. Our sole goal is to get Kelsey out in front of everyone. Like I said, she doesn't run off, and someone knows where she's at. Kelsey, we just want you home. Call us if you can, and we won't quit looking. It's taking way longer than expected to seat a jury in many cases, including the Tennessee prosecution of Key Anthony Garrett. He's accused of killing 51-year-old Cynthia Green, his next-door neighbor, by beating her with a clothes iron and stabbing her. Authorities say Garrett's DNA is on the iron and on broken dishes found near the victim's body. Originally, he told police he had never been inside the victim's house, but later admitted he had been there once. We are watching, rather, for opening statements in that case. We are also continuing along in reviewing uh, what's happening in another case we're watching here. That is the trial of Kellen Winslow II. Five accusers accused the former NFL player of a series of sex crimes. A jury convicted Winslow last summer on three counts and acquitted on one count. The jury was hung on nine other counts. Well, today we learned that prosecutors will not retry Winslow on two counts related to the accusations of Jane Doe number 5. She's the 77-year-old woman who said Winslow made lewd gestures in a health club. Prosecutors secured a conviction as to one act of lewd conduct, but the original jury acquitted as to another accusation that the accuser admitted she couldn't clearly see in a jacuzzi. Prosecutors will not retry Winslow on two counts involving cruelty and battery against an elder. On cross-examination during the original trial, the defense suggested Doe number 5 was paranoid about Winslow because she'd seen his legal troubles on television. The defense also forced a retreat on what happened in the hot tub. This is part of the reason why the prosecutor chose not to retry this part of the case. Did you tell him that that's the same man from the TV? No, I did not. I hope I knew he was the man from the TV. If I knew he was from the TV, that I saw him 
Okay. I could have just called the police myself. I didn't have to go to the manager. I, I had to call the police right that moment. Right. If I knew he was the same guy, so I didn't tell, know. You tell your husband that this guy did some strange things to, to you, right? Yes. Right? And he said, okay, you know, you guys talked about <laughs> it, and then nothing happened for another two weeks. He kept insisting to me that I should report it to the manager. Yesterday you described, uh, you know, his hand movement. You remember that? Right. Okay. You said that the way you described it is his hand was below the water and then you moved your shoulder, it's your right shoulder, up and down. Remember that? Right. Okay. But you couldn't see underneath the water? No. You didn't know what he was doing with his hand? No. You didn't know whether he was rubbing it, uh, a leg or anything like that? You don't know. Because you couldn't see? Yes. Byron Brown and Gigi Gonzalez back one final time tonight. So, Gigi, this makes sense to me. I think prosecutors are dropping the absolute weakest charges they had. They're turning around saying, well, we got one conviction and one acquittal as to Jane Doe number five. Let's not retry these elder abuse charges because they're kind of a stretch. They are a stretch and they're right to retreat on this. You know, this woman, she had obviously been validated in her um, in the charge against uh, the defendant when he conducted lewd conduct in the equipment room. But that might have taken in, uh, changed her perspective as far as what went down in the jacuzzi. Everything went below the bubbles. She's already had a heightened fear of this guy from her previous encounter. So that might have had a lot to do with what she perceived in the jacuzzi. And the prosecution was right to just cut, cut their losses and go forth with the stronger charges in this case. Byron, look, we've got, uh, what is it here, three convictions, uh, one acquittal, and now two charges, null prost. I'm counting uh, six left here. Uh, this is the uh, list of charges that resulted in a hung jury, so let's get rid of the last two, and we're going to trial on six charges here. Yeah, I think you have to go with the strongest charges, and I think they learned from the first go-round, the ones that are weak, and I always think that you go with your your strongest cards, so to speak so to speak. I yeah. think there's a, a theory out there of kind of cooking spaghetti and throwing everything against the wall. I'm not a fan of that. So I like the strategy the prosecution is employing. I'm not either. I'm not a fan of it either. So we'll watch this case as soon as things get going. Hopefully that will happen soon. Appreciate the input, Byron Gigi. And thanks for those of you watching along with us. We appreciate it. Our live coverage picks up tomorrow at 9 Eastern.